Peter is a senior fellow at the Kellogg Innovation Network, which is based at the Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University in, in the Windy City, Chicago. Uh, he's also a partner at the uh, US-based strategy consulting firm Clerio. Clerio right? Partners, I've been working on that, which apparently is a play on a Greek, so the Greek word for clarity. for clarity, which we all seek in our lives, I guess. Um, He's a business strategist. He's had more than 30 years' experience working right across the spectrum, uh, both uh, regionally, the US, Europe, and also across many uh, companies such as uh, Rio Tinto, BP, um, BHP, and, and so on. Um, yesterday, I had the pleasure of shepherding Peter around the traps in Wellington, um, the energy and mining uh, stakeholders in particular. Uh, we visited Shell and the usual uh, collection of, um, of bureaucrats and the Treasury um, and uh, Ministry. I don't think they're in. Um, <laughs> Before you say anything, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, use, we'll use our previous speakers to Chatham House Royal, right? So, um, but the, the contrast between meeting with business people and government officials was, was quite marked. And, um, I can, you can guess where the enthusiasm lies. Um, anyway, but that, the, the point is that I think Peter made a very strong impression on, on, uh, on business, um, particularly those representing the uh, oil and gas and mining industry. Um, and this message that we're going to hear about tonight is very important because, uh, in my view anyway, business working in a socially and environmentally responsible way is the engine. <coughs> So, without further ado, please welcome Peter. Thanks, Basil. Uh, so, it's really good to be here for the Energy Matters Lecture Series. Uh, and thank you, Basil and Amanda, for. Uh, allowing me to participate and inviting me back, back to New Zealand. It's always good to get back. So what I want to do today is really, uh, I guess, walk th you through some thinking and notions that we have and a around a provocation called to, for the resource industry. And the resource industry is the minerals, the mining companies, and the oil and gas companies. And that is uh, the necessity for them to move from an isolated actor uh, to one of a truly integrated development partner with society. Um, and what I want to do is talk to you about what that means uh, and some of the work that we've been doing with the industry and also maybe put some vignettes from our discussions in Wellington yesterday that were very interesting. Sometimes uh, Basil was cringing with because I'm kind of candid with what public servants say to me and I'm probably learning that I shouldn't be, right? Because I might get in trouble. So the first thing is what do we mean by resources? So it's kind of a general term. So just put a few pictures up there. So we mean open pit mining, underground mining, uh, shale gas, shale oil, and we'll talk a lot about that, you know, particularly because there's a lot of discussion, a lot of media coverage around that. Uh, and of course, nece necessarily water, which is a you know, vital resource. And if you think about it, the only resource that we can't survive uh, without is water, and you know, we can do without the rest. Um, so we'll talk around you know, the whole notion of the resources and also the reconciliation of what society wants to uh, the supply of these resources. And I'm not going to share with you any kind of bias towards clean and versus carbon-based fuels, that, that's not the discussion, or climate change, I and mean, that's kind of not what the discussion is about. So it's more about how we do things to meet the needs of society on a broad basis as an industry. So I wanted to share with you four quotes, okay? And these are four different companies. I want to just, you know, this aspect of social license and sustainability. So I want to level set that. So when I talk about social license, the definition I adhere to is social license is where society provides a compact or allows an organization to participate and be active in whatever it's offering, a product or service or an activity in that region. Very, and uh, that's distinct from the license to operate. So license to operate is I do everything legally, you know, that the law requires me to do, what my contracts require me to do. The social license is quite different and it's not something that's in writing. 
uh, and it's kind of a squishy notion and it's one that companies, particularly in this industry, have a real hard time getting their heads around. And then the issue of sustainability, uh, we talk about it not in just a pure environmental sense, it's about social sustainability, it's economic sustainability and it's environmental sustainability. So we're not just talking about a kind of a green thing. So the four companies here, these are all companies that intuitively understand that the social contract is a very, very important element of doing business. Okay, so what we see, the first quote, is the social contract between industry and society is fraying. This is actually from Nova Nordisk, a leading pharmaceutical company uh, in the Nordic countries uh, acting upon diabetes. Okay, so they see the pharma industry at threat. The second quote is actually from Unilever, from the CEO of Peter Palmer. Okay, the third quote is from the CEO of Anglo-American, the third largest mining company in the world. And the fourth quote is from Coca-Cola. Okay, and I pick on those quotes because if you look at this whole issue of social license and sustainability, I kind of think there's four phases that you go through. Okay? So the first, and you see companies that are all across the spectrum. So in the first phase is really what we would call kind of greenwashing. So they pay lip service to the notions of sustainability and social license. The second phase of maturity is then we go into CSR reporting. You know, this is a world of compliance and reporting where most companies are stuck in. Okay, the third phase is when you start doing these things because it enables you to take cost out of your business. So if I lower the inputs of water, plastic, etc., so like Sony has the road to zero, that actually goes straight to my bottom line. So it's kind of a profit motivation and it has good implications and uh, impact on society and in the environment. And the fourth one though, and is commonly termed the fourth estate, is a term the fourth estate, which Amanda shared with me yesterday, which is where companies recognize that they need to act in a way to use it as a strategic lever for growth and also to develop their social uh, contract with society. Okay? And what we see is there's probably I don't know, maybe two dozen companies in the fourth estate that are at varying degrees of maturity and you'll see companies and exec leaders that are at different phases of understanding and evolution, if you like, around that. Um, and we'll talk about some of the forces that are shaping this whole aspect of social license. So just show of hand, who know, who's heard of and understands social license or is kind of in tune with it? Okay, a few people. Okay, so hopefully we'll uh, inform you a little bit today uh, about what it means and what some of the industries are doing. So what are the forces that are shaping this? First of all, this very fuzzy slide called around investors. So we spent uh, in August uh, two days in the Vatican, we'll talk a bit more about that, with 25 CEOs from the resource industry, oil and gas and mining, uh, uh, hosted by Cardinal Turkson, who's president of the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace. And he talked to us, and we, one of the things we talked about was this investor activism, and there is a tsunami out there somewhere that's going to come over companies, and we don't know when, um, and it's up to the industry to think about, do I wait for the investor activism to hit me, or do I act and take leadership in the industry now? Okay? And if you just want to put that in numbers, so the Christian churches, excluding the Seventh-day Adventists, I don't know why they're excluded, but they are, um, they invest $200 billion in the stock market. 200 billion out of churches. And the Catholic Church represents probably about 60% of that. And they all collaborate. Okay, so that's a big number. Then the socially responsible investment funds called SRIs are investing around a trillion dollars. Okay, so it's 1.2 trillion so far into companies. And then there's another about 2 trillion in uh, pension funds like CalPERS, who are more and more being asked through government regulation to act in a more socially responsible way from an investment. Okay, and this is very important because the Vatican told us that 80% of public companies and nearly all resource companies fail the filters that the churches apply to them for investment. Okay, and they feel that's not uh, okay, so they don't want to change that as well. That's pretty a pretty stark statistic, okay, so a lot of other industries are in the bad books too. So, um, so it's kind of, so there's a lot of investor pressure that's mount, that will begin to mount. So I think that's an important thing to understand because, you, know, you know, at some point money always talks. The other thing, iPhone, this, this is a big issue. We have to, and the industry really has to, this whole, we have to reconcile two almost conflicting forces that are going on. And that is society's demand for things like this, okay, an iPhone, and we'll talk about why that's up there. And a, a growing uh, thought process is growing in a bigger percentage of the population that we can't take oil, we can't use carbon-based products, we should stop mining, etc. You know, so we should stop all these things. But society is complicit in asking for all these resources. So if you look at an, and this is a reconciliation that needs to occur, and there's an education element. So, I mean, they do surveys in the US and it's the same here. Most people don't know where electricity comes from anymore. Really. I turn the light switch on, they don't know those big 
trains that have black stuff in it aren't going and burn, being burned for, you know, for power. So an iPhone, every, so the, a friend of mine at the Manhattan Institute, they did a study and, found, and came to the conclusion that an iPhone consumes the equivalent of two massive refrigerators of power every single day. And you go, well, my iPhone doesn't do that. But everything you do on your iPhone is in the cloud. Okay, and there's massive server farms that Google and Facebook have. So who uses Facebook? Okay, fine. Yeah, we do. So a few people. So every time you're on Facebook, that's driving big Facebook server farms that are usually housed in a state in the middle of the United States that's 100% coal-fired or natural gas-fired because it's reliable and it's cheap because they've got a business to run. And every time we're adding, and you know, we've got another billion iPhones coming around the corner. So that's demand on energy. And then we've got a billion new people coming into the, you know, into the planet in the next 25 years and hundreds of millions of people moving into the middle class that want fridges, TVs, motor vehicles. They want our way of life. So this is a huge demand on steel, iron ore, coal, okay? So, so on one hand, we're demanding all these gadgets that demand all these resources, and plus there's 17 rare earth metals inside an iPhone that have to be mined, okay? Uh, demanding all these things, yet we're being very activist against the very companies that are trying to supply it. So, yeah, so that's really a reconciliation that needs to occur in society and of education. And the other notion is that, you know, and I'll use electricity uh, or power as um, proxy for this is you know people want four things out of their energy accessible reliable affordable and clean do you agree okay you want your energy boys on reliable accessible so it's in your house you don't want to pay exorbitant money for it and you want it preferably to be clean but people will trade out number four for the first three they won't trade out reliability accessibility and affordability for clean they won't there's a small percentage of society that probably would, but the majority of people in the developed world will not, and certainly the developing world will not. So that's another reconciliation that be, has to occur. So that's a conversation that has to happen, okay? Uh, and it's not an easy one, and, you know, so... And we'll talk about how, you know, through creative coalitions and, and dialogue that we can bring people that are antagonistic towards each other normally into a conversation, a dialogue, to try and solve some of these, reconcile these issues. So, so don't go and throw your iPhones away after this, please. The other thing is this massive activism that's happening. You know, community pressure, it's happening. So this is a picture, I don't know, who's seen this picture? No, I didn't get to New Zealand. This is two weeks ago in, in Canada. Five police cruisers, torch, rock, uh, Canadian Mounties in full riot gear. I mean, this was nasty. And look at the sign, no shale gas. It was all about First Nation tribes protesting about they didn't want shale gas production to happen in their tribal territories for these ones. It was nasty, it was messy. I don't think Canada's had a riot like that in 30 years where they've had cruisers torched, etc. So there's a lot of community activism that's happening uh, because they fear some of the you know, uncertainties that shale gas has, even though it's a huge economic multiplier. Okay. Then we see all over the world, you know, Buddhist monks protesting uh, in London, actually being you know beaten up by other, you know, and you know, so all over the world there's this activism, whether it's Burma, China, Australia, there's activism. Other things that are happening are, you know, unilateral nationalisation, changing of royalty and taxation arrangements in countries, including Australia, South Africa, African countries, companies investing billions of dollars in a resource, and then the government turns around and says, thanks, we're nationalising it. Or thanks, we think you're ripping the country off, we're doubling your royalty. So, and what that does is increase massive risk in projects and investors are getting unhappy. Okay, so, you know, I don't have to put my money in resource projects. So this brings another notion in. Okay, and this is a provocation for the mining companies themselves, and we'll talk about... So I co-chair this effort with the CEO of Anglo-American, uh, Mark Udafani in Australia, and they're based in London, Anglo-American. And he says, you know, the problem is this, the industry's facing this massive issue, uh, and if we don't resolve the issue as an industry today, what's going to happen is we will not be able to provide at an affordable level the resources humanity is asking for to live the life that we are. And what that means is supply shortages, massive increases in price, okay, and it is a train wreck that's, you know, heading that way if we continue to operate as an industry in the way um, that's happened, okay. Um, and it's really about bringing parties together. So I put up, you know, every presentation has to have a social media slide, right? I think that's important. But the, th the point about this is social media has enabled indigenous people around the world to communicate to each other in a very rapid manner. So in the past where all companies, whether you know, it be Apple with their manufacturing in China, resource companies, when there's an incident, it's out. 
in the, in the internet in a blink. So companies have lost the ability to spin, control, contain, whatever it is, any incident any, in any corner of the world, doesn't matter if it's in the darkest corner of Africa, up in the backwoods in Canada, in a province in China that's so far away nobody knows that it exists. All these things are out and in the media before you know it. And it gets bigger than this too. So the First Nation folks in Canada were telling us, because you know, most of the indigenous people in Canada are pretty poor, uh, but they have iPhone, they have phones, and they have Facebook accounts and Twitter accounts. And they communicate with the Maoris in New Zealand, the African tribes all over Africa, the Aboriginals in Australia, New Guinea tribes. And they're all sharing stories. How are you going with that resource company? What's a good, you know, and so they're sharing stories. So they are working collectively to increase their capability to negotiate with companies. And this surprises resource companies. How are these people in Africa getting knowledge about what we just did in Canada two days ago? How did that happen? Okay, and social media, and they're all surprised. You know, it's like, so, you know, it's kind of, a, it's almost a naivety, right? You know, like, these people are not going to be using Facebook. So, um, and, you know, the Maoris are very active. Uh, and that all the uh, iwi tribes, I mean, they're all very active. So it's something we, uh, as again, uh, all the stakeholders, whether the industry themselves, NGOs, etc., need to be very aware of. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is kind of take you on. So we at the Kellogg Innovation Network, and you know, Basil mentioned that uh, I'm a senior fellow there. Uh, the Kellogg Innovation Network is basically a global community, cross sector, across about 35 countries. Um, and we convene in different ways, but what our vision is is to enable global prosperity through innovation. Okay? And we convene in different ways, and the Kellogg platform provides an independent, no, no hidden agenda, safe environment for organisations to come and join in a dialogue. And we embarked on a, a process called the Catalyst, okay? and we picked on the resource industry first to do this journey. And that is to, through that platform, is to uh, create creative coalitions, which are very, and we'll talk about what those look like, uh, to go into a, enter in a dialogue so we can reconcile the differences, understand where everybody's coming from, uh, agree upon an approach for transformation and then move forward, rather than fighting each other. Okay, find the common ground, bring them together and move forward. And we're going to talk about how we've done this for the mining industry, which start, that journey started in Brazil in April last year. Okay? Uh, and we're about to embark on it in starting in February, uh, the Kelo campus in Miami. Okay, uh, and we're doing it for the oil and gas industry, starting with the shale gas and oil. We'll talk about why shale gas is very important. So if, before I continue down that path, who knows what shale, when I say the word shale gas and oil, who knows what I mean? Okay, well, not everybody, so here we go. <laughs> so shale gas and oil is basically, it's oil and gas trapped in shale in the rocks, okay, and, um, you know, and it was pretty well assumed that we would, it wouldn't be able to be extracted for probably another 20, 30 years. Okay? But nobody told a guy, George Mitchell in Texas, about that. Okay, so he was a wildcatter. So he worked, and these are even people in the industry, so he worked on three technologies, okay, which one was horizontal drilling, okay, one was the process of fracking itself. So fracking is a really bad word, actually. But so fracking, and then the other one was using geo software for understanding what the resource body looked like. And he broke the DNA code of this, so he could do it at scale. So in essentially less than five years, the U and the US is the one that's kind of embarked on this with vigor, the US has totally you know, up upset the whole energy equation in the world, okay, tremendously. Okay, so you know, to, you know, within three years, uh, the US will probably be a net exporter of oil-based products. So we're talking in like seven, eight years, we've gone from importing 10, 15 million barrels a day to shipping five million barrels out. Uh, natural gas is dirt cheap. Okay, three bucks a BTU versus th 12, 13 dollars in Europe, 15 bucks in Japan. So competitive advantage, okay. But with that has come a lot of issues, okay. And, and we'll talk about those issues. And I know, you know, Europe's having a tr you know, difficult time, particularly the UK with shale. Uh, you know, different countries are looking at it, and, and I know there are potential shale deposits uh, in this country as well. And you know, in Australia, it's coal seam gas. So, big, big issue. So anyway, what we did with the catalyst is, we, as I said, we started in April in Brazil. So this is kind of a photo vignette of the group. We brought together 40 leaders. And when I say leaders, this included people from senior mining companies, junior mining companies, the United leader from the UN Habitat, president of Oxfam, uh, First Nation representatives, okay, research people, academics, suppliers who supply to the mining industry already, like Caterpillar and Komatsu, companies that were looking to supply to the mining industry, like GE and 3M. So this is a pretty holistic group, 
and was representative of you know, most of the stakeholders. Okay? We trapped them in a very remote part of Brazil for four days. There was no escape. Okay? Really, I mean, we were like 55 miles from the nearest airport, uh, and there was a lot of nothing between us and the airport. And it was really, really constructive. And what we were able to do was understand where everybody was different. Okay, very important, listened. Okay, this wasn't about a lot of presentations, it was listening and working together. And we listened and we understood where the differences. And then we worked towards, is there enough ambition in the room to actually do something different? And there was. So that group collectively went, and the key thing is many of them said, you know, we're usually antagonists. We usually come into a room or maybe a courtroom with you people, you know, and fight. So the fact that this was a constructive dialogue was pretty powerful. And this is what the group collectively came up with to fundamentally change the extractive business model of the mining industry from an insular reactive to an integrated and proactive development partner, and they should miss the word using the framework, delivering on economic, environmental, and social shared purpose. And that's pretty powerful. And you might say, oh, well, that's easy. I mean, anybody could draw that up. The point was, is being able to take these people that are antagonists together on a journey to come up with a solution. And since Brazil, we've had a working group uh, meeting on multiple occasions, and this is some of the photos from the work that we've done, uh, usually at the Keller Company. So we're actually meeting again next week, actually, for two days. Uh, so, so some of the companies, mining companies, family foundations like the MacArthur and Ford Foundations, Oxfam, Eden Project, Forum of the Future, Research Triangles, uh, Resource Capital, which is a private equity fund. So again, a very diverse group. And what we've been working on in the last 12 months is something we call the Development Partner Framework. And I'm going to share this with you because it has application to the oil and to the whole resource industry. Uh, I think there's a lot of and based on the talks we had yesterday in Wellington, a lot of application to New Zealand. Uh, and I think because I really feel that the mineral industry and the oil and gas industry here is kind of at a turning, at a pivot point. Uh, it could go either way, frankly, after listening to the conversations yesterday. There's a lot of disconnects going on uh, in here. And I want to bring up this point of creative coalitions. What, what we do at Kin is, which is really, really good, is creative coalitions. Okay, and that's a term that I've unashamedly stolen from Pascal Lamy last week. So Pascal Lamy is the former head of the WTO, uh, a Korea public servant, 30, 40 years in civil service and gov you know, national government, international bodies. He succeeded uh, Mike Moore, New Zealand, former New Zealand Prime Minister, now the US Ambassador. Um, so, and, and what he said last week, quoted, was to say that, and this is amazing from him, he said that he no longer believes that governments and international bodies are able to solve the intractable problems facing humanity. And what is needed is creative coalitions that form, that are cross-sector, and are self-formed based on common interest and common passion to change. And once they've created the roadmap or whatever it is, they disassemble themselves. Because if they stay together, they become monolithic and open to uh, self-interest and lobby groups, etc. It's a very powerful statement from him. He's a very sharp guy. And uh, so he, that statement came out of a, a group he convened at the uh, Martin School at the Oxford University about how we're going to solve the intractable problems uh, facing humanity. So, and, and I'm a total believer. I, I mean, I have total, I have zero confidence in government at most levels, except city level, okay, at national and state level, and certainly international wise to resolve anything because it always gets dumbed down to the lowest common denominator. I mean, they can't resolve something. And one of the former speakers here, Sony, Tony Brenton, uh, great friend, we had him out at the Kin after we connected after this. I mean, he says, you know, I mean, climate change is the single largest embarrassment uh, on the globe, our inability through the UN and other mechanisms to actually come up to any conclusion. And he said, there's no one country to blame. Because he said, everybody's operating in their own self-interest. And when that happens, you can't get uh, agreement. So um, it's very disappointing. And then you might say, what in the world were we doing at the Vatican? Who thinks that? So, <laughs> so it's kind of, yeah, what? So what happened in Brazil was quite funny, actually. So we're all talking, and it was in a lecture theatre, so we are tiered seating. And the president of Oxfam, Ray, you know, one of those silent moments you get in a group, says, why don't you guys go to the Vatican? And they really, like, turned and looked around, what are you talking about? And he said, well, they're actually very activist all around the world, and they don't like what you guys are doing. Okay, and in Latin America, they're very out front, anti the industry. Not anti-mining, anti the industry and what you're doing. In Africa, working behind the scenes in all countries, the Catholic Church is, through different religious orders and Catholic NGOs are working to support their communities to get a better deal and they don't like the outcomes that are occurring due to the mining and oil and gas industries. Very negative. So through a series of meetings with Cardinal Turkson in Rome, we convened the CEOs and chairmen of all those companies. Okay, represent about 30% of the total revenue of the resources industry. 
and we had a day of reflection. And what a day of reflection was, I mean, we stayed, actually, just from a personal note, it was amazing, we stayed in the Santa Marta Hotel, which lay people don't stay in normally, just inside the Vatican. The Pope was one floor above us, because he lives in the hotel, because he doesn't want to go to the Papal Palace. He had breakfast next to us, table next door, walking around, I mean, very humble person. So that was kind of amazing, kind of an experience. But, you know, we actually talked about how, what are the problems that we have? We listened to church people that are on the ground in Latin America, Australia, Africa, about what they see. It was very, very powerful. And we had you know, CEOs that were you know, spiritually moved through the process. They said that. They became very vulnerable uh, through the process. So what they now do in their companies is another issue, right? But I think we move the ball down the field in a recognition that something has to happen. And the Vatican uses language called faith-based, okay? So it's not about we need to be like Catholics or we need to be Christian. They say, how do we do things in a faith-based way? Which is basically translates into doing the right thing particularly for the disadvantaged people where a lot of these projects are operating in. So, so again, this was part of the industry engagement that we ha had, uh, you know, I guess, planned. So you've got to take people on a journey if you want to change an industry, okay? Which leads us to this. This is kind of a 12-step program, okay, for changing an industry. So the Forum of the Future made it six steps, because I guess 12 steps is too, either too long or too controversial. So the first step, like 12 steps, is you have to recognise you've got a problem, okay? So I would say the mining industry believed 18 months ago it's got a problem, but not the whole industry, because you can't get a whole industry to move. One leader, one CEO, Mark Udafani, said we have to change it. He was brave enough to step out of his industry and say we are failing society. Those are the language he used. We are failing on our obligation to society and we need to change the industry. Or somebody will change the industry for us and we won't like the outcome. Okay. So you need a leader to step out, okay? And in the case of oil and gas, Baker Hughes, who joined us in this process, have also had the same wake-up call, and they have decided through their CEO, and these people have to go to their boards to ask, is it okay to do this? Because they're going to start using language that a lot of their peer group don't like. So Baker Hughes is willing to step out of the gang and say, in the area of unconventional oil and gas, shale oil and gas, we are failing society. Okay, and as an industry, we need to transform ourselves Otherwise, this is a train wreck, okay? And the problem is the, the big oil companies who aren't in, involved in shale gas, because it's a very entrepreneurial activity, um, uh, initially sat back and said, oh, that doesn't affect us. They, they'll kill themselves. But there is blowback, because people don't distinguish one oil company from the other. So BP and Shell and all that are recognising that if things go bad in shale gas and oil, it's going to blow back on them as well. So they've become interested. So where we're at with the mining industry is we're kind of around creating uh, pioneering practices and we'll walk through that now. Uh, and with the oil and gas industry in February, we're going to start the steps one and two, okay? So it's a journey, okay? You show, them the, you show them the well and then it's up to each company to drink from that well or not. And I'll tell you why and when we get through this as to why, you know, once certain companies start adopting things and doing things differently, it becomes a competitive advantage. And when a company has a competitive advantage, other companies begin to change because they start losing business as a result. So this is a very nice diagram. So this is the uh, development partner framework. Okay. And I want to focus on two areas here. One is those three bright green areas, shared purpose, flourishing ecosystems, and competitive communities, and talk a little bit about each of those. And these are fundamental to a social license. Okay. And then some of the things uh, around enabling companies to do this. So shared purpose is really the notion of you don't do anything to, you have all the stake, you convene all the stakeholders. So in New Zealand's case, it would be all the Maori tribes, communities, <coughs> national NGOs, international NGOs, uh, all levels of government from you know, the Wellington through to regional councils, to the mining companies, suppliers, business, you know, everybody in a room, not a town hall meeting, not like this, round a table and you figure out what is the shared purpose for this project. And you sit there and sit there till it's done. And you don't start. And the reason you do this is because that it takes all, from a company's perspective, it takes all the risks out of the project. Because what happens is when this isn't resolved, you get all this activism that just adds massively to the cost of projects, delays projects by years. So this is very, very important from a company's perspective to happen. And it's important for the indigenous people because they have their issues put on the table. And the other notion in, within this kind of process is the notion of conflicting rights. So we have to change or reconcile the conflicting rights. So it's, a, it's an interesting term, Google it. But so con uh, examples of conflicting rights are, for example, ownership versus stewardship. 
So it might, usually Western mining companies, even the Chinese company, we, you know, we own the resource. Whereas the Maoris, most tribal indigenous people, are custodians of the land. And that's a whole different notion. Okay, economic advantage versus preservation of the multi-generational spiritual and practices of a community. And this is not just indigenous people. This is about communities that have, like for five generations, farmed in the United States, in the Midwest. So this is about that economic gain versus, you know, what's in a community. Okay, it's about who's at the table versus the underrepresented and the poor people. Okay, so it's all those conflicting rights that you have to go through, and the list is quite long. So you have to decide what are they, and then work through them. Very, very important. Okay. Um, I think this also provides a framework and a platform. So when you do have issues, so I learned in New Zealand, when you have an issue, you go straight to court. Okay. You have a description, you don't go to arbitration, don't have a meeting, go to court, because that's the way the acts are set up. And then you sit in court for five years. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not good for the company, it's not good for the Maoris, it's not good for the communities, and it's not good for the country. I mean, that's ridiculous, actually, to be frank. You know, but you know, that's the way the law's set up. So, and, and they were explaining to me, that's why one in seven people in Wellington are lawyers, right, or something, professional people. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought that only happened in the US. But you know, I mean, the court is the place of last resort, not the place you go to resolve initial disputes. So that's what happens. And in fact, it's, so, it's almost like they say, we know we're gonna have disputes, so let's just go to court. You know, I mean, for, so it's kind of, kind of ridiculous to me. Flourishing ecosystems, this is this whole issue of biodiversity, uh, water, okay, that's one other big thing is resources suck water. Do you take water out of the food supply system and therefore threaten food security? Okay, so this is the notion that when a resource project starts, this is not about you clean up and make it as good as or better than it was when you arrived. It's about you make the environment better from day one. Okay, and one of the notions in shared purpose is we, we want resource companies and communities to think, stop thinking in terms of life of resource, because most companies do a life of resource plan, and when the resource is depleted, that's the end of the plan. Okay, so what we're asking them to think in, uh, you know, in an extreme 100 year plan. You need to think 10, 20, 30 years out beyond when the resource is depleted. What are you going to be doing? And that's putting a responsibility back on the mining company and the oil and gas company. It's a big deal. Okay, but I think the leading companies, and you know, we met with some of them yesterday, I think there are people, there are leaders in New Zealand all around the world that are willing to do this, and they need to, because they recognise the need that has to happen if they want to get done what they want to. Um, so very important. An example that happened in South Africa, which is kind of around you know, conflicting rights, so and this is amazing because it's a South African company, so you'd think they'd know better. So they developed a mine in a village, in a community, and there's a store in South Africa called Pick and Pay, so supermarket like Woolworths, et cetera. And they thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we put a pick and pay store here and then everybody will have choice. So put the pick and pay store in the town, supplied all their goods from somewhere else, and they totally destroyed the livelihoods of all the villagers who were doing you know, uh, cottage farming. And so the, actually after one year of pick and pay, the community was worse off, dramatically worse off than it was before pick and pay arrived. So our notion of, oh, you know, we gave them products and blah, blah, they hadn't thought about it. So they should have been sourcing a lot of their products from the local farmers, okay? But that's not how pick and pay thinks. So, I mean, that's just a little example of, you know, how these things can really throw out. Because, you know, a lot of the villagers, they don't want pick and pays. They just want to keep doing what they do. So what's the notion of um, prosperity to us may not be the, the notion that other people have. So we've got to be careful of that. And the last one is this whole idea of competitive communities, companies, and countries. This is an obligation on the company to work with society to make sure that when the resource is finished and depleted, what remains is a country that has competitive infrastructure, that has communities that are competitive, educated, and that are companies that are competitive. What happens today normally is either you import the labor, like Chinese, really bad. Okay. So uh, Greenland has just approved the which is pretty shocking, because their economy's kind of tanked an iron ore mine in Greenland, and they've given it to the Chinese, and they're really excited, but the Chinese are going to import 7,000 workers you know, into Greenland to do, so no jobs for the locals, okay, so that's not really that competitive. But the whole thing is that, you know, what happens when the resource pro is depleted is the ecosystem usually collapses, because it's geared to, for that resource. So we're turning that notion around and saying, you need to actually build industry and infrastructure that's not just tied to your company. And you need to think thoughtfully about how you do that. And we're saying that it's not good enough to write the royalty check 
to the government and then say we've done our business, we sent the $100 million to the government and if they send it to Switzerland, spend it on the army and don't give it to the community, that's not our business. That's the wrong thinking. Okay? And plus, most uh, communities uh, connect the company with the government and you are complicit in the government squandering the funds. So I had an interesting discussion in Wellington yesterday, which kind of shocked me, government department not to be mentioned, <laughs> thank you, Basil, is I said, you know, you're doing this big development in Taranaki, and yes, Taranaki is the richest, you know, uh, province in New Zealand, so I'm told, and, they, and I said, well, what about this notion of, you know, taking some of the, ro you know, the royalty flow, tax flow from oil and gas production and applying it to the you know, community? Oh, no, I can't do that, wouldn't do that. Couldn't put it in a regional development fund, you know, it's got to go into general revenue, and then we apply it to the poor regions. And I just, you know, and, we t and then I heard from other sources, then the government says, oh, and then you'll get trickle down. I mean, tr it, nothing ever trickles down, okay? It just doesn't happen. And I'm just like, oh, you know, I mean, so the poor people in Taranaki is, you know, they're the ones with the resource and all the activity. And people go, well, you don't need the royalties because you've got the economic activity, et cetera. So that's just false thinking. So, but the company has to have the dialogue with the government, I believe, with all parties, and say that is a wrong notion, full stop. Okay, so Starbucks is famous. They did a thing in Africa where they were having a coffee bean plantation. And it was in one of those kind of funky African countries with a military regime. And they said, this is fantastic. We want you, your contract will be with this import-export shipping company in the capital city, which was run by the brother of the president. And that's where all the money will flow. And Starbucks said, I'm not doing it. The money has to flow through the community or I'm not doing this development. And two years, and then the government buckled. Okay, and said, okay, so because so, Starbucks recognised that their reputation was on the line with the community. That's who was going to bad mouth them. They did, so they forced it. So resource companies need to take the same approach and have hard discussions with government and say that's not okay in terms of operating that way. So that's, you know, I think that's going to be a hard discussion in New Zealand as well. So, you know, Australia's squandered its resource wealth of 10 years. I don't know what you think, but, you know, it's basically poured the money down the drain. Okay, and, and there's no lasting anything in Australia, I think, from you know, billions and billions of dollars of royalty. So it's, it's disappointing. So it's not just a plague on developing countries, because our tendency as white people in the developed world is, oh, it's their problem. It happens in Africa, it happens in Latin America, but we don't have that problem, and that's wrong thinking as well. So, just to be provocative. And last, we just want to talk about enablers. So the big challenge for companies is they go, even if they go, yep, we want to do that, oops, we don't have the capability to do it. We don't have the people with the skills. We don't have the education. We do, even if we wanted to do this, we don't know how to do it. And the people that we have in the field are not equipped. And the people universities are pumping out to us are not educated in this way. So it has to change. So there has to be this whole notion of, uh, I think, a re-equipping of the education, both in um, undergraduate degrees and postgrad degrees, executive education to give capabilities to existing management teams that are in these situations. Because most general managers of any resource project have no idea, because they're engineers and geologists, to how to interact with indigenous people, how to have effective meetings, etc. So, and they just try and tick the box. And then those kind of propeller head people called sustainability people fly in from head office for a week and then they vanish, <laughs> got through the sustainability meeting. So this one, and that's just, you know, uh, sustainability is, has to become everyone's job. Social license has to become everyone's job. So again, that's the thing. So one, this is not going to happen without CEO leadership. This is not a bottom up, it's not middle management. The CEOs have to step out. So Mark Kudafani stepped out. Gary Goldberg, CEO of Newmont, is stepping out. Sam Walsh has got one foot out the door from Rio Tinto of stepping out. Okay? So we just see these people. Baker Hughes, the CEO, is willing to is stepping out. So as these companies change, and Mark has an interesting thought, he goes, we will take this framework and they are beginning to apply it to the strategy and tactics of Anglo-American, okay, and to become a true development partner model. And he says it's that interpretation that is proprietary to my company. So this is all open source, it's out there for everybody. How we apply it is proprietary and will give us competitive advantage. And, as, and then we will become the partner of choice for countries and communities. And that'll start locking out other companies. So what happens as the market forces work, either companies will change or the market forces will push them out and bankrupt them. Because countries will not want to deal with these companies that aren't acting like an Anglo-American or a Baker Hughes. And that's very, very important. 
So this is a joint statement Mark and I have signed. It's in our framework, and I'll read it to you. It says, we are asking leaders of mining, and we can say, and oil and gas companies, and communities to take an active role in reshaping our future. To accept that our long-term prosperity depends on the strength of our relationships with all of our stakeholders, to recognize the extent to which we all have skin in the game, and to believe that we have a responsibility to work collaboratively to realize our shared purpose. We are calling for courage to reset the way we operate and to be willing protagonists in redefining our future. It's time for us to lead and it is time for us to act. Okay, so, and he actually says these words in investor meetings, analyst meetings, wherever he is, this is this, and he keeps drumming this drum. Okay, uh, and you know, his company's taking it forward. So, so just kind of wrapping up, it's really important, I think, for effective development of resources that this kind of approach needs to occur and that there's got to be a much more kind of radical collaboration between all segments of society. All people have to be invited in the room, even people like Greenpeace, Sierra Club that are all, almost anti oil and gas, anti mining. They, they, have to be, they probably won't turn up, but they have to be invited. And if they want to come, they, you have, we, we have them in. Because you know, if you hear union, you know, if they, this is my provocation to them, if you sit in a room and you've got unions, communities, mining, you know, all these constituents going, we believe in doing it, but in a certain way, you know, they either start reshaping how they think or they start becoming, looking like dogmatic and unreasonable people, okay? So in the case of uh, shale gas and oil in the US, you have a strange situation where the unions who are left wing, who usually side with these NGOs, uh, with business, because they want these high paying jobs, 75 to $120,000 per person, jobs and we're talking hundreds of thousands of people okay so unions are over here saying this has to happen okay and a couple of just kind of thoughts is shale gas is replacing coal in the united states okay and if you look at the statistics it is going to have the single biggest impact in reducing carbon emissions in the united states of america than any other clean energy initiative in history or any regulation okay that's pretty big, and I'm talking about substantial re reduction. In the US has actually, carbon footprint's actually been declining in the last 10 years, okay, without any carbon trading scheme, because there's, you know, companies are doing things, state governments are doing things. What's happening in Europe is a bit upsetting because natural gas is so high, they, so they are shutting natural gas power stations in Germany and replacing them with coal. And they are actually gonna have a carbon emissions spike in the next 10 years. Carbon emissions in Germany are going to increase over the next 10 years, because they can't afford natural gas at $13 a BTU, and because they're already paying somewhere between two and three times the price for electricity as the US is. So it's starting to become a competitive disadvantage for their industry. Okay, so, so these are the kind of things you've got to understand. It's, it's a very complex world. There's lots of moving parts. There's lots of interests that you have to reconcile. Lots of people you have to listen to. It's a journey we all have to go on. I think it's important for humanity that we do, uh, do this and make it a success. Otherwise, you know, I do believe there is a train wreck because you know, nobody's gonna be happy paying $20 a gallon for gasoline because there's a shortage, or nobody's gonna be happy when you know, houses are triple, quadruple, or you, sorry, we ran out of iPhones. You can't buy an iPhone for six months because we've got no rare earths left, okay? Or sorry, all the server farms are shut down because we don't have enough energy to run them. Okay, so you know, we're gonna get unhappy, right? So, so you know, I think we all have a part. We, you know, we're all voters, we're all people that talk to other people. So I think in New Zealand's situation, I. I really think, you know, government needs to understand that this needs to happen. And they are not the people that are driving the train on this one, driving the bus. They are a passenger in the bus like everybody else. Okay, and that's, I think, hearing the language in Wellington, I think that's going to be a very difficult thing for the New Zealand government to get their, wrap their head around. So, but we'll see. I think it will be an exciting journey to do that here. So, uh, so I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. And uh, I'd like to open it up for questions, if there are, are any. Otherwise, it's your question standing between us and a drink, right? So, cool. So thank you. Thank you.